ago, I did a tr teacher training session with the Walder Educational Center in Chicago. And Mr. Sidney Glenner and others lent us real coins from the time of the Chorban, from the time of Bar Kokhva. And we came back the next day and the teacher said, every year on Tisha B'Av, I try and feel it, I try and cry, but I can't. But I held this coin that had a picture of the Beit HaMikdash in my hand and I couldn't sleep the whole night. In Yerushalayim, in Eretz Yisrael, in the scene of the events, we have the opportunity to feel and to connect to what we learn in verse, to what we learn in Mishnah, and to what we read in the keynote. I will try and share with you those feelings from here. This site is called the Burnt House because the fire of the destruction was evident everywhere. Josephus Flavius tells us that in the drainage channels and the sewage channels, people hid from the Romans, even for some time after the Chorban, from after the destruction, this is such a channel. As an archeologist, we can see and identify items because we find that the same type of items often again and again and there are markers there are fossil director of a name and that you can say ah I know exactly where I am we are in second temple period Jerusalem in the scene of destruction but first let's talk about what the life was a moment before clay even ain't a mikablim tuma stone vessels do not become ritually defiled. The safest thing to use in case somebody makes a mistake, somebody is unaware that defiled, it doesn't ruin lunch, it doesn't ruin everything that's being developed. Because there are different sizes of cups, it's quite possible that these are gradated and are not for use for lunch, but they're part of production. It's possible. The Vessels, some are made for liquids, some are made for foods. This is a cooking pot. And we can tell that from the ash and how it was burned and because it was found in many ways. And this particular style is from a moment before the destruction. Because it was found here, then when we find such a pot elsewhere, we also know that we're in that period. There's a series of weights. 28 weights were found here and then others were found afterwards. Again, it could be part of a regular kitchen, but it doesn't seem so. It seems that the facility that we're in may have also been a domestic house, but that in the basement or part of the facility for sure, there was some type of production going on more than home use. So it seems uh, basalt grindstones, very tough, so it's not going to wear out for grinding. Beautiful glass vessels for special either perfumes or other ingredients. Ingredients, that's interesting. And also made out of clay. Coins. Coins and even a mold for making the coins. You would pour the hot metal in, it would become a strip and then you'd break the pieces off. And again from the coins we know we're a moment before the destruction. Oil lamps of Roman and Jewish styles with burn marks by the opening where the wick was. An inkwell. And here we have some of the most moving finds ever from the time of the Second Temple. This is a stone weight that's marked 
and two have now been found, and they both have the name Katros. The Gemara in Psachim has an elegy said by Akina, said by the Chachamim. Woe is to us because of the following families of the high priests. And Katros, from their quills, Rashi says, decrees which exacted taxes which were not necessary to aggrandize their own wealth and power. An abuse by the families of the Kohanim Magdolim of their position. It's very, very sad. But that tells us that either this house itself or somewhere in the neighborhood, because maybe they borrowed a cup of sugar, maybe they borrowed the weight, is the Katros family of high priests mentioned in our sources. In the digging for the foundations of the restored Tiferet Yisrael synagogue, which is a few feet away from us, it was all part of this complex and uh, Dr. Oren Gutfeld found another one that says, Katros. Interesting interpretations of what the phrase are. And now we come to a very painful find. A spearhead. A rough one. It's crudely fashioned. Deadly in the right hands. It seems to be the type of weapon used by the rebels. And several were found here, broken and whole. Here is a picture of one as it was found. And we're going to see another one. And now from the most painful scenes found of the Second Temple period's destruction of Yerushalayim. This is a young woman's forearm. We have experts that can tell that it was a woman's hand and her age. This was a young woman's forearm. It's even possible that her arm was locked off by the attacker in a vicious move, which was known at that time, and that's why it's not with the rest of the body. That's even possible. Let us now go to the real scene where these items came from and where this happened. The structure that we're in is actually much larger than just these rooms. The decision of the government was excavate, find, salvage excavation, but then we're building a neighborhood. This was so special, it was determined to be a historical site to be open for natives and for visitors under modern homes and restaurants functioning and schools functioning above us. Some of it was excavated to the floor. So for example, in this room, you see various kilns and materials and grindstones. That's a production area and it was excavated down to the floor itself. In the distance, you see a table. The table top is original, and they put grindstones on top. That is a serving table. You would have food sitting there or other items sitting there and then uh, coming to your individual table. But it's a, a table that's multifunctional, as any table is, and the base is recreated as others were. And then there's places for water and for liquids. It, it, together with the finds here, maybe this was for the production of the Ktoret. Maybe this was one of the families, like Beis of Tinos, who knew various secrets of how to do various processes, which they did not share for other people. As the Gemara and Yuma says, the Talmud says, they didn't want somebody else to take it and abuse it. And they were careful, and any girl that married in, any woman that married in, they said, you're not going to wear perfume because we don't want anyone to say that we personally benefited from the process of the Torah. It's possible that this is where that was made. It's in the realm of possibility, but it's definitely for production. In this area and in this area, they left the destruction as it was. And you see broken pieces of the same type of equipment of grindstones. And here is a tabletop, just like that one, shattered from the destruction. There are three intact in the Jewish quarter today. One here, one in the Herodian quarter, one in Reb Nachman Cohen, Oliver Shalom's house. This is a broken one. 
we have pieces of others that were broken, but here you're seeing the moment of the destruction. We are in the destruction of Yerushalayim. Now, I must be honest and say, it's possible that this house is destroyed in the infighting between Jews. This is possible that this is destroyed shortly before Tisha B'Av. But we are in the story of the destruction of Yerushalayim of Tisha B'Av, and this house is burnt and is part of that story. We have a kina that we read. It's really about an event in the Middle Ages, about the communities that were destroyed in Worms and Magenza and Spire in Germany. But the words are meant to evoke, and as we do on Tisha B'Av, we connect the tragedies of Jewish people, of the Jewish people throughout the centuries to the moment of destruction. So, can I just flow with pain, with tears? And the refrain here is, Al Beit Yisrael Val Am Hashem Kinaflu Bechariv, and the house of Israel and the nation of God who fell by sword. And in the second paragraph, it talks about the beautiful virgins and the delicate children all wrapped up and burned and destroyed. And we are in a place where the weapons were found and where a young woman's arm was found. And these words evoke this tragedy here. And as the Rambam says, we connect the events to realize that what happened to us throughout the generations has meaning. And if we feel that on Tisha B'Av and respond to that and evoke to that, to the Eicha, to how did this happen, we can then come to the Tu B'Av, we can then come for rebuilding, we can come to renewal and to Geula Shleima. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,